House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Okay, welcome back into the House of Mystery, where it's hotter than 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 normal. <laughs> I mean, things are burning around us. They're after us, you know. This is it, you know. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, bad, you know, bad, we got bad comments on the show. <laughs> I couldn't believe that, you know. My God, why Why would someone want to attack us? Anyway, we'll just leave that alone. I'm so still fine. venting. So I'm still venting. <laughs> still venting. Well, so it's, it's, it's almost August, another beautiful... Uh, month in the summer of the North America, the summer of COVID. And, uh, but today we're going to go back. We're going to go back, I guess, to 1922, and we're going to take you away. And uh, who's going to take you away is our guest. Uh, it's Tessa Lunny, who's written a book called Autumn Leaves, 1922, a Kiki Button Mystery. So thank you for being here, Tessa. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, we'll see if you say that at the end of the show. <laughs> you might not be happy. No, we're professional. We're on the network. We have to be. Hmm. <laughs> well, you know, within, re yeah, within reason, you know. You know I, um, so listen, Tessa, let's, let's get to know you. We, we don't know much about you other than uh, mm -hmm. you've got this new book out. And um, what, first of all, do you consider this book a historical mystery, or what would you classify this? Yeah, I guess it is a historical mystery. I tend to think of it as a spy thriller. Because it does, it's, not a, it's not solving a crime. Uh, Kiki Button works as a spy. Uh, but it is most definitely historical fiction, so historical spy thriller as the subgenre, I guess. Hmm. Well, 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 kind of what um, what intrigues you about that type of writing? Because that um, that's a special type of writing, right? To go back to, I guess, this takes part in uh, 1922. So um, to go back, uh, you know, almost a hundred years and to mm. write about a, a, a thriller or a spy, a spy story, um, that takes a lot of extra work too, right? So, uh, what, what gets mm. you, what gets you going with this type of book? Well, I love to read historical fiction and I love to read history. And I have a doctorate in Australian literature, which looked at war fiction. So I spent a lot of time reading both uh, books and veteran war stories written in the 30s, 40s, 50s, as well as reading a lot of contemporary fiction about that time. So I'm really steeped in it, I guess. I just really love it. I just really love it. It is a lot of extra work, but I'm doing the work anyway. So that's partly how I got to write the book, is that I wanted to read more about 1920s Paris. It's such a fascinating and exciting place and time. And I was trying to find a thriller. I was trying to find a crime novel that was set in that time. I found some set in the 30s. And, of course, there's Agatha Christie, but sometimes she can feel a bit period, a bit dated. I wanted some with something that had modern ideas, modern values. And searching, searching, couldn't find it. And I realised, Tessa, you're going to have to write it yourself. What you want is so specific. <clears throat> hmm. You're going to have to do it. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you can't find it, write it, right? Mm, um, mm. But um, I would think, um, for me, uh, one of the um, hardest things is when I'm watching or reading something from a time like this, 1920s, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and they don't take the time to get the, the phrasing right or the, uh, mm -hmm. the, the character's behaviors or what they do. Uh, w mm -hmm. fit the time you know I, I, mm -hmm. I see that a lot lately and it sort of really mm. frustrates me um, so that's what I mean by taking extra time and work that must mm. you must really have to you know immerse yourself in that and and look around and really figure out what people would say or how they would talk how they would act dress what was kind of in and what wasn't yes you do absolutely but I've been, before I wrote the first book, I'd been reading about this period for about 10 years um, just because I loved it so much. And so in that, sense, in that sense, it was pretty straightforward to write the first book. I, 
I've been reading a lot of books sort of written in this period. And one of the things that's so exciting about the 1920s, in my opinion, is that it feels so modern. It feels so contemporary. The things that they're talking about and the way that they talk and the way that they write, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel far away. Virginia Woolf and T.S. Eliot and Hemingway still feel so, so precise and modern. They were so far ahead of that time. And that also made it easier that there, it didn't feel like I had to go back and go back and rearrange how people thought. Also, when you do historical fiction, one of the things that's fun to do is to explain or explore why people behaved as they did. Sometimes if I'm reading books set in the 1920s, a character will, will go along, and I think I understand them, and then suddenly they get married or they suicide. And I think, what? What happened? And it has to do with all the cultural backstory in the contemporary world of where they published that I don't have access to and I have no idea of. And when you write historical fiction, you can put all that research in is as I've gone through and gone, why has that character done that strange thing? And researched it and gone, ah, oh, so that was the cultural conversation they were referring to and relating to. And I can put that in and I work that into my work that into my story as well. And for me, what's most interesting is how World War I continued to have an effect every year. It was always, it was sort of the, the unspoken underlying conversation throughout the 1920s was the war and what it meant and how it was still so present in people's lives. Oh, I'd imagine, right? I, I, mm. I was just, I've been working on a, a story from uh, Germany from Berlin in 1924 oh, yeah. and, oh, yeah. and how the impact of the war and I would imagine because with France as well with the Versailles mm. Treaty and all that right I'd imagine mm. it's, it's very influential with people yeah yeah well it's still so very it's still so very present I mean not not only like in all the politics uh, but also just in people on the streets there's not enough men, and a lot of the men are injured either very visibly, you know, and begging on the streets or not visibly, but you can tell from the way that they move, talk, walk, that they're carrying this trauma. And Berlin in the 1920s is so interesting and fabulous and so outrageous. And for me, that's, that's clearly a reaction to the war and the Versailles Treaty and the hyperinflation making life seem not real, not, you know, a bit crazy, and they acted on this, this craziness. How yeah. interesting that you're writing about Berlin in the 1920s. I want to write about Berlin in the 1920s too. Well, it's because I'm writing around uh, Fritz Harman. Mm -hmm. And Fritz Harman was the guy that, uh, you know, him and his uh, lover killed at least 27 people. Yeah. And he would do it for the clothing and for the food, right? <laughs> It was just like, it was the strangest thing. But I had to do so much period research and really, because mm. people had to understand what was going on with the lack of food and, like you were saying, mm. inflation and and how many mm. poor people there were and all of that. Mm. So, um, mm. But but yet there was great, great drag bars. Great drag bars. <laughs> yeah, the night the, the nights I've seen in Berlin from everything that I've read was just phenomenal. Like nothing, yes. literally any, anything goes. Have you read, have you read the Philip Kerr's Bernie Gunter series? No. Oh, I've read them all. But the final one, I've read them all and they start, they're about, they're about Bernie Gunter who's a cop in Nazi Germany. And it's his progress through the war, but they're often written back where it's after the war and he's thinking about something that he was forced to do in the war. But the very final book is called Metropolis and it's set in 1928. And the Nazis are just starting to take a to take a hold as an idea, but they're not present. But he describes the nightlife, and I'm sure he researched it brilliantly. And some of the clubs he described are bizarre and awful and amazing, but also horrific. There was one with a with an electric chair where they they <laughs> conducted fake executions. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's horrifying, horrifying. But this is but the the the. the People were so desensitized to violence and desensitized to a thrill that they had to kind of ramp it up again and again and again. And this is yeah. how people went and drank. It was, I yeah, it's crazy. It phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And the drags. And, you know, how the, the doctor in, in one of their research centers would get uh, 
uh, police passes for people that were uh, drag queens or uh, in tra- you know transitioning, mm-hmm. and so he would give them so the police wouldn't arrest them. So wow. in Berlin, you had tons of drag bars and drags, drag queens hanging out. So it's just, a, it's just I just think, wow, it's crazy. Uh, you know uh, that that went on a hundred years ago, and and it just it, you think we'd be further by now, but um, <laughs> well, well, a lot, a lot happened. A lot happened in the rest of the twentieth century. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the Nazis came along, and Nietzsche, and all that stuff, and mm, and uh, then half of the Berlin was communist for a yeah. long time until thirty years ago. So yeah, yeah, a lot happened. But yeah, yeah. you think. You look back at the 1920s, or I look back at the 1920s and think that was, they took so many leaps culturally, socially, and then, and then so much happened. Yeah. And we had to take some of those leaps again. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of reminds me of now, but <laughs> I, all I can say is, you know, writers from 100 years from now will probably be doing an interview just like this and talking about 2021 and, all, and the way people acted. <laughs> well, I hope they are. I hope they yeah. are. Mm, well, maybe you can do that. Literally on fire. Yeah. Hey. Well, well yeah. you you just you know you'll be alive. Come on. <laughs> just, uh, As a floating head. Yeah. Eat healthy and and you'll be fine. So. <laughs> So now in this book, Autumn Leaves, and this is the second book you were saying of Kiki Button. Um, mm-hmm. So who is Kiki Button? How would you describe Kiki to, to the people uh, and listeners? How would I describe Kiki? She's a sassy spy heroine gossip columnist who's also moonlighting as a spy. She's an Australian socialite debutante who ran away to become a nurse in World War I, uh, and she joined as the... She joined as a voluntary aid detachment, uh, so a sort of non-professional nurse early on in the war and lived through the entire war and then nursed all through the pandemic afterwards. She was, she was hooked into the spy life by her surgeon, Dr. Fox, and when she ran away from him and ran back to Australia and ran away from the war and all of her memories, but when she got home, she realised she couldn't handle it. She needed Paris and she found her way back in April 1921. She's sassy, hard partying, hard drinking. Uh, She loves all of her, she loves to go out and be decadent. Um, But she also has a keen sense of the importance of friendship and of other people and of creating a better world than the one she left at the end of the war. And that's what motivates her. You know, you sound, that sounds just like Dave. This is Dave's story. You know, he's a happy <laughs> son, and he needed to get back to Paris. He's a spy on the side, you know. <laughs> that just, is for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never know. I'm wondering, you know, in creating Kiki or um, mm-hmm. any other character, have you ever had a character, or whether it's Kiki or anybody else, who's done anything to uh, surprise you while you were writing it? Writing the character. Oh, have the characters surprised me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, they have. And Kiki surprises me as well because uh, Kiki, I have as one of the, like, Kiki's motivation is to say yes. She's motivated by being free. So sometimes as I'm writing, I'm thinking, what would she do? The answer is she'd say yes. And so I let her wander into all sorts of situations that I hadn't planned on her wandering into at the beginning of the scene. It's fun. It's fun to write like that. Sometimes I have to rewind a bit. I'm like, no, that's too much. She can't come back. <laughs> she can't come back from that. Uh, but, yeah, but, yeah. Boy, she is like Dave, always saying yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> More. Um, well, what, do you, what do you hope Kiki demonstrates, or do you? Do you have, kind of have a plan for the main character? Do you, do, do, is there something you want her to accomplish for people to see? Hmm. Do I have something I want one. her to accomplish for yeah. people to see? Well, I guess <clears throat> I guess there's two things, but it's not, it's not so much what the character would accomplish, but what I'm, what I'm having fun with and what I'm trying to do with the books. Now, first is that she's a really strong female lead. And she's not, and although she has trauma, she's not burdened by her trauma and so I've read a lot of in thrillers I've read a lot of sort of strong female leads who are either overburdened by their trauma 
and need to be rescued. And I didn't, I didn't want to read any more of those women or who have absolutely no trauma and seem to be impervious to the life that happens around them. And that for me doesn't feel real. So I wanted a, I wanted a character who was a com completely in control and the agent of her own life, even when life is, is difficult and forces you to take paths that you wish you didn't have to, that she has enough internal strength, even when it's difficult to be able to choose, choose her own life and choose the right thing and the right thing for her, even if it's not what other people would do. And so in the structure of the novel, that's what I'm trying to achieve, where she's, she's in charge. She's in charge of the action, even when all of the pressure of the time wants to force her to be subordinate, particularly to the men in her life. And secondly, the thing I wanted her to do is to look at the rise of fascism in particular and in general um, fanatical ideologies that was going on in Europe in this interwar period. How, how does fascism start? How does it take hold? What are the conditions that make it take hold? What are people attracted to? What are people attracted to with, with like violent revolutionary communism? Because a lot of people were and it was a really important force. Where, but now, a hundred years later, sometimes it can look very strange. And I, I can look at it and go, I don't even understand how it began. Was everyone mad? They can't have been mad because that's just my great-grandparents and my grandparents' generation. And so to look at what people were talking about and what people were thinking and have Kiki be right at the beginning of that and be in the middle of that and hearing what people are thinking, reading the news and going through it step by step to, for me to try and understand how these ideas came about and to... And, my thinking is through her because it's all written in the first person so I can explore my own uh, research and explore my own journey from ignorance to this ignorance, shall we say, uh, <laughs> through Keepy Button. Mm. So I guess it's those two, those two things. Very interesting. You know, when you're writing Kiki, do you, do you hear her voice in your head? I, I know I hear voices. <laughs> so that's right. <laughs> and do you have an inner monologue? Um, or do you write more images and symbols and, and stuff like that when you're creating that fiction? Oh, no, I hear voices, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely. I, I, it's like I see it sometimes, like I'm watching a film and I just transcribe mm. it. Um, it's a beautiful and bizarre feeling. And when I can't see it, when I can't hear it, when I can't hear them talking to each other, that's when I know it's going to be a bad writing day. And I feel yeah. that I, sometimes I still have to write, and it, but I feel it's like, blocking character moves here and then you know i've got like little aspects everywhere it says says something witty and then character moves <laughs> here does something they talk about this thing off stage and i'm like okay you're gonna have to come back tomorrow when <laughs> you've had more coffee and more sleep mm -hmm. um, yeah but i definitely i hear it in i hear it in my head you guys are both loony <laughs> <laughs> loonies across the world you could start a club you know do you, do you <laughs> both drink that. Like what? <laughs> it's just the way my imagination works. Sometimes the drafts of my novels feel like memories. Like they feel like a, like a, like a dream-like memory and they have yeah. the same texture in my mind as something that actually happened to me, but they're of imaginary people and these things never happened, but it has the same texture. Hmm. Oh, isn't that, isn't that, doesn't that happen when you come off the drug? <laughs> I'm trying to figure this out, you know. I, yeah. I think it's the other way around. I write so that I'm not taking drugs and ending mm. up in an asylum. I'm like, this is how you get out of the other voices. And you put them somewhere safe and you make them do something constructive and contribute to the cultural conversation instead of creating dramas in my own life and then ending, ending up doing something bizarre oh, well. and irresponsible. Yeah, but, you know, but when you do something like this, I, I would imagine... Um, you know, I'm coming from writing nonfiction, so I, I, mm -hmm. I, this is bizarre to me, but I hear uh -huh. it all the time. But when you say that, that, you know, you're kind of writing yourself through Kiki in a way, like, you, you know, a lot of what you learn comes into it. Um, mm. Do you feel vulnerable by exposing some of your own self, you know, feelings and doubt and everything else through the character, putting it on paper? I think every time you put something public into the world, you're a little bit vulnerable. And it doesn't matter if it's just a tweet or an Instagram post or if it's an entire novel. 
because that's a little bit of yourself out there in the world for people to look at and possibly to judge. But the flip side is that people can engage and converse and, and then you create something, something new, something beyond either the tweet or the novel. And so the, the risk is definitely worth the reward. But in terms of putting myself out there, I feel actually more protected by writing through fiction than I do writing for myself. Because even though I'm writing through Kiki Button and she's written in the first person, I also have a cast of other characters. So if I have aberrant or difficult or even nasty ideas, I don't have to express them all through the one character, Kiki. I can put a bit over here and a bit to this other character and then these minor characters can, can explore this different idea. So, for example, and, and then... So it's sort of spread around. And for me, actually, that, that feels protective, but it also creates community because we all have thoughts that we wish we didn't have, that we can't quite own up to and admit to. But by putting them in characters and then in situations, especially situations that I would never, I will never be in. I will never be in 1920s Paris. I will never watch The Rise of Nazism. It's, it's impossible literally impossible. So I can put other ideas into these times and to these people and have them and have them play out like that. And that I find not vulnerable. In fact I find it interesting and when I and, and protective and when I read it from other people I feel that there's a there's a conversation going on. Me as a reader to other people's writing and other people reading my writing as well. Um, so the other characters, now where do they come from? Like are they taken from people you run across in your life um <laughs> like you know you happen to be out out in a bar or a coffee shop or uh, in the shopping center and you see someone and, and you go well that would be a good character or some someone is, is that kind of where they come from uh they come from all over the place sometimes they're all just bits of me sometimes they are uh inspired by i guess particular friends or particular people uh, but then I change them so that they're not an exact comment on that person. They've just got, they've just got. Uh, sometimes it's just a feeling. Sometimes it's just a, a way of communicating. Me and a particular friend talk in a particular way, and I've given it to one of Kiki's friends. Um, and then sometimes it's other, it's things that I've read. A lot of it is things that I've read, or commenting on different, different tropes in other books as well. It's like I really want to talk about. So her, her spy master, Dr. Fox, is manipulative, but also fascinating. And so I really wanted to talk about that kind of dangerous, fascinating, uh, Svengali-type man, whether it is Svengali or whether it's Mr. Darcy or um, Mr. Rochester and Jane Eyre, and sort, of up, and sort of talk about him, but in a 21st century way. Why is he fascinating? And what if he wasn't? What if he was just abusive? And where's the line? And how does it function in literature? And I find that really uh, super fun. So, yeah, it's not all people I know. It's sometimes it's a lot of it is commenting on what I've read. Okay, that's fascinating. But now we're getting to it. So what people do you know <laughs> <laughs> that you write about? And tell us about your friends. Come on, we want to know. <laughs> oh, so very personal. Yeah. Well, most <laughs> of it, most of it. So Kiki's best friends are Maisie Chevalier. Bertie Brown and Tom Arthur. So Maisie Chevalier uh, is, was a nurse in the war with her and Kiki lost touch with her for a few years and then found her again when she um, returned to Paris. And Maisie is Australian as well and has uh, First Nations heritage but is making a life in Paris with her French husband. Maisie's not somebody I know. She's more the friend that I, w I wish I had. Or I wish I had if I had been that Kiki person, I, the friend that I needed when I was 25 and I didn't quite have, uh, but I didn't manage to get until I was in my 30s. So she's a bit of some of my best friends and then a bit just made up. Bertie Brown is more inspired by a particular friend of mine um, and it's not so much in who he is, sort of upper middle class, bit posh, um, a bit of a dandy, but in the way that Kiki and Bertie speak to each other is the way that I speak to this particular friend of mine. 
And Tom, Tom is also, Tom is also talking about an archetype, the tall, handsome, country-born, yet still sophisticated Australian man. And he's got a bit of a growly voice and he has a very sort of hyper-masculine yet larrikin presence. He's a very, he's a big figure, I guess, in the Australian cultural conversation. So I wanted to, but he's always, he's sort of another one of these Teflon people where it seems that life doesn't affect him. He's always Mr. Chesty Bonds. He's always the larrikin digger and the Anzac and the, the soldier of Crocodile Dundee and he's not a... Like he's not changed by his life. And so I wanted to talk about, well, what if this man was changed by the things that happened to him as so many uh, Australian soldiers who had participated in World War I were deeply affected by what had happened to them. So that's, I've met, I mean, I've met and dated some of these men, but because he's such a strong cultural idea, but it's, it's also talking about him as a cultural idea and then changing and playing and, and having fun with him, especially with him as a romantic figure. I'm wondering, how, how do you keep track of your storylines and characters? Do you have any tools, any <laughs> processes, methods? <laughs> um, I write a very detailed plot before I start mm. writing. I, I didn't for the first one, but I only had one child then. And writing the second one, mm. I had two children, and I would have one hour to write, so I had to drop in, write my thousand words, and then the baby needed feeding, and then that was it. Time's up. So in order to do that, I had to write a very detailed plot outline, um, sort of like a 10,000-word plot outline with heaps of backstory so that I could just jump in and go, uh-huh, all right, second half of Chapter 7, good, I'm here, and then jump back out. How do I keep track? Um, a lot of notes. <laughs> a lot of <laughs> notes. But I... I try not to let, like, the minor characters will just pop in in one book and then leave. They have a cameo, but then they don't return. There's only a a handful of characters who have returned in a major way between book one and book two. And I can keep track of five characters. It's not a big deal. And uh, although sometimes I did have to, like, go through the PDF I had of book one just to double-check, hold on, did he say he did that in... That year or the other year? Mm. Really just to, yep. like to nitpick those details. Because um, certainly I like to binge read a series, you know, and it's, it will only be like a week or a month between me reading, you know, book three or book four, and I remember everything. And so if the writers contradicted themselves, I find that very irritating. So I tried as hard as possible to make sure that all the details um, between book one and book two were... <laughs> lined up and were precise. Um, I could get most of it, but yeah, I did have to double check my, my manuscript. Hmm. Well, with all that drinking and drugs, I don't know. You'd have to write it down. <laughs> How else could you keep it together? I don't know. I'll just write everything down. You write this story. It's a spy story, you know, kind mm-hmm. of a thriller, suspense, all that. Mm-hmm. Um, under the story, is there something else, a subtext or some sort of thing uh, that you want people to take away from the book, you know, especially because you do bring in, um, you know, about the fascist and and the Nazi regime, which comes in later, but um, is is there something that you hope people take away from it other than the story? Uh, Yes. Yes, there is. So I like to think, well, the way I hope that I've written it is in layers. So the first Layer is the fun plot with the parties and the famous people and the spy thriller. And if you, you can read it just, just in that top layer, if you need to have a bit of fun and be taken away from the pandemic and the bushfires and other things going on in your life. Uh, but I wanted to put in layers underneath that of, of, as, it, as I mentioned before, the rise of fascism and the everyday face, the ordinary face of politics and and how politics both affects our daily lives, but also how you can watch something slowly unfold like the rise of fanatical ideology. I wanted to explore a lot, what does it mean to be a modern woman? What does it mean to be a woman in the modern world? And this is a time in the 1920s where, where people and women especially were confronting that question. It wasn't just kind of happening to them. They were really thinking about it and pushing for the vote and pushing for 
greater rights and pushing back against cultural mores like smoking in public and drinking in public and wearing makeup and short skirts and it doesn't seem like a big thing but but the cumulative effect of everybody shortening their skirts, cutting their hair and smoking felt like a revolution. Um, and so there's all that as well. How do, what does it mean to be a modern woman? What does it mean to have control of your life and to make, to make a choice? And I hope to reflect that both in the character and in the structure. And then under that, I mean, I wrote this as I was thinking about it during the Australian bushfires of 2019 and 2020 and I was writing it all through the pandemic and I had a tiny baby and I was thinking a lot about loss and how to live with loss and how to deal with uncertainty and in a in a in a changing world so there's the there's a subplot with Kiki where she's come back to Paris after a year and a half because she spent a year in Australia grieving her mother who suddenly died and she realised that her mother was not at all the woman that she thought she was. In fact, her mother was a completely different person in Paris and she needs to find out who her mother was. And so through that subplot, I, I hope to have explored feelings of loss and grief and uncertainty and when you find the world is suddenly destabilise and how do you keep your feet on the ground when it seems that everything is shifting constantly. So, yeah, I hope there are all, I, I hope, for me there are all these layers in it and I hope that people are able to choose the layer that they engage with. So what's the short answer I need to know? Like what are we doing yes. with unstable? <laughs> oh, what are we <laughs> Yeah. No. Yes. Get, give me the answer. Come on. Oh, Free what do we do with an unstable world? Yeah. Keep going what? forwards. Oh, is that all? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. One foot in front of the other. <laughs> One foot in front of the other. One thing at a time. Uh, and keep your friends close as well. And your that's enemies closer? <laughs> <laughs> well, a spy not novel. Come on. Your enemies got to be there too. <laughs> yeah, the enemies are close, but uh, no, Kiki, Kiki doesn't sacrifice that. Not yet. The enemies aren't closer than her friends. Her friends are everything. Well, that's it. You know, it's interesting. So do you think something like this will be a, a long series with Kiki? Or, um, I really hope so. Do, do, you sort of, do, you pre, do you plot out when you have a series like this? Uh, when you're writing a, uh, a character through, you've done two books, but do you, do you plot out like six or seven different stories and kind of decide? or How does that, how does that happen for a writer? Ah. Well, for a writer, I don't know how it happens for other writers, um, but for me, I just write one book at a time. I do have an idea of how the series could stretch to 1939 and what would happen through the 20s and then what would happen through the 30s and how there would be a change that would reflect the political change in Europe between the 1920s with its parties and it's free spending, and then what happens in the 30s after the crash and with the rise of Nazism, Nazism and becoming the government of Germany. But I only have one contract at a time, so <laughs> each book could be the last, and so I just write my heart out uh, for each book. And I know, what, I know what would happen with the next one. I know where it would be set, and I know some of the the famous people who would have cameos, um, but we'll just have to see. Oh. <laughs> well, maybe she'll end up in Roswell and find the UFO. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Look, Kiki, she's, she's a woman who says yes. Who knows what could happen? Well, you've, um, you've done a, obviously you've done a lot of research. Um, to mm-hmm. create this character and create the story and create the world that you've created. Have you uh, read anything or do you have any influences that might be surprising to fans? <clears throat> that might be surprising to fans? Um, oh, I don't know what people would be surprised about. <laughs> well, do, you, do you go to Megadeth concerts? Do you... Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, well, I've read a lot about the 1920s and I read a lot of history, but I guess people might be surprised that this came out of my doctorate 
on war trauma and looking at how mm. and looking at how war trauma was written by professional writers and that's what I was that's what I was looking at in my doctorate um, because the war the war trauma and the war stories is sort of a subplot it's not the main plot it's not even the main emotional thrust of the book but it's sort of simmering there uh, sort of underneath everything around everything is this idea of the war uh, so people might be surprised that that's that that was the origin, that that was the origin of, of my idea. Originally, I had a, a, a huge idea of a World War I series that was a crime, but also romance and satire and absurdist as well and comic, and then that idea was just much too big, it wouldn't work. So I cut it in half and wrote a more. At the same time, I was writing a more serious World War I book and the first Peaky Button book, April in Paris, 1921. But uh, April in Paris almost wrote itself. It was just too easy. And that's where it came from. Mm. So I guess that would be surprising. I guess that would be surprising how much I'd, I'd read about trauma. <laughs> mm. I mean, I just, you know, come on, there's, there's more to it. She just doesn't want to tell us yet, but yeah. um, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, we won't no, tell no, 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 you. Okay. Want. If, if you want a specific answer, you should ask me a specific question. Yeah, there you go. See? <laughs> yeah, no, no. How, is, how has this changed you? Like, and I mean this, like when you complete a book and it's finished, you know, all the added, everything's done and it's about to be published, um, do, do you feel like you've, you've been through something? Does it sort of change you in, in a way? Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing to finish a book and to complete a work. It makes you, well, you feel proud even if the work is not good. You feel proud that uh, you've reached the end. But because I'm... I guess, how do I phrase this? In two ways, it changes me. Firstly, that I'm thinking through ideas of the contemporary world through this historical template, like the rise of fascism and what does it mean to be a modern woman, thinking through these ideas. Then I do come to some conclusions, not necessarily a resolution, but, but to some ideas through the writing of it, to the end of the book. Um, secondly, there are a lot of, it's been a very emotional year and a half, shall we say. We've all felt it through pandemics and riots and fires. And so to be able to, to write through some of these emotions in the book changes me. You know, there's, I'm not just holding on to everything. There's some, of, there's some way to let it out and then to communicate and commun with other people, with, with readers and then reading their work and to participate in that conversation. And that changes me as well. And thirdly, just in terms of my craft and my writing, every time I complete a piece, whether it's a poem or a short story or a novel, I've had to really think about what I'm trying to do and how to use this medium of language and just these little symbols on a page to say something, to say something that's important to me and often in a way that's quite oblique, especially when you're using historical fiction I find that I'm actually writing about something else and the historical fiction is, the historical moment is the template. And so how to push the language to make the template, um, to make the template into more of a mirror to reflect something that I'm thinking and feeling about the contemporary world. So each time I just, I hope I just get a little bit better. Not a lot, just like a thumbnail better every time. So I guess well, that's how it changes me. After, um, you know, writing, uh, you know, the darker aspects of mm -hmm. uh, stories. Do, do you have a way to decompress or do you even need to decompress? Can you just move on to the next thing? <laughs> uh, often the writing of the darker aspects is the decompression because the darker aspects ah. come, come from my personal life and then I can decompress through yeah. the writing. But that's not always the case. So when I did, it's often the reading that I need to decompress from. Um, as I mentioned, my, my doctorate had a basis in trauma theory and war trauma. So I learned how to lindy hop in my doctrine. I learned how to swing dance. So, yeah. and I, and I, and I love it. Uh, but yeah, that's what I would do is that I'd read books about the most horrible things that people can do to each other through the day. And then in the evening I would dance. <laughs> that's how I let off steam. 
<laughs> yeah. And now I have two, I don't dance that much, well, it's a pandemic, I can't. But I have two small children and they, they love to laugh and they love to play. And so that can be a great decompression as well. And they don't, they don't care about anything but right now, what's here in mm. front of them. And they just want to have fun. And if I'm a bit scratchy or upset, then that makes them, that makes them scratchy and upset. It's like they catch it from me. They're sensitive to it and they whinge more and they cry more and whatnot. But if I walk in with a bit of a bounce and a smile, and then they bounce and smile. And, they, uh, and so sometimes I might fake it. I'll fake it for a few minutes and get them bouncing, and then their bouncing makes me bounce, and then we're all smiling and I can decompress <laughs> that way. Wow, it's too complicated for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so listen, how do, how do people get a hold of you? How do you want people to find you? Like do you have a street address or a phone number or a, web, <laughs> or a website? Or, or like, Because um, this is the day of social media these days. So, you know. Sure is. So I do have a website, uh, which is my name, tessaloni.com, and you can subscribe to my posts. And you, through the website, you can get onto my Instagram accounts, with my personal account, uh, which, and also my Kiki Button dedicated account, which is just about Paris in the 1920s. And that's Miss Kiki Button at Instagram. And I also have a Twitter account there. Uh, so people can contact me through any of those ways. That's Miss Kiki Button if you're nasty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, well, that, I, it's interesting. How, so how did you, – you must have been writing a lot of this during um, the last couple of years with all the – at tense times and stuff. So that, yeah. How did that? How did that go for you? I know. I know writers quite often isolate themselves um, to write anyway. So maybe not being in isolation, but I wonder if the uh, the, the tension, you know, the tense times and the uh, stressful things that mm -hmm. go on around you. Do you think that seeps into the writing? Do you do you think if you look back at it in ten years, you'll see a little bit. Of darkness oh, I don't even have to wait 10 years. I was conscious that it was happening as I was doing it. And I was oh. changing the plot because I was changing the plot because the world was too much. And I needed to, I needed to both reflect that and escape at the same time. Um, so I, I will say that Australia and where I live in Sydney didn't suffer as much with the pandemic as the States did. I feel very lucky and grateful that it wasn't so bad here but nonetheless we did have lockdowns and I did have a tiny baby which made me extra fearful um, of what might happen because we're certainly at the beginning we didn't know how it would affect us uh, yeah but and then the Black Lives Matter protests happened as well and then the way that sort of happened in Australia and then still the pandemic and then the leftover from the bushfires yeah, it felt heavy. The world felt heavy. Uh, and it definitely found my way into my writing, partly with the, uh, in all sorts of ways. So it's set in autumn, in late October, in Paris. And as I was going through the manuscript, I realised how many times I used the word grey. The stone was grey, the sky was grey, the streets were grey, it was often raining, Kiki's unhappy. <laughs> so something something really small like that, there's a lot of images of, of greyness and flatness and tipping into darkness. Uh, and then secondly is the, the rise of fascism and the political conversations and the revolutions and thirdly with what the characters are dealing with. It's been four years since the end of the war and things are starting to rise to the surface. They suppressed a lot and they can't. I don't have the energy to suppress things anymore. And so I have memories and, and fears and nightmares are rising to the surface and they have to deal with them now and they can't get away. But at the same time, it's also Paris and there's some of the most fabulous people there and wonderful clothes and parties and champagne and cocktails and a, a feeling that the worst is past and they can go forward into the future. So the difficulty of the world reflected itself in both of those ways, both an escape into the parties and also this bubbling tension and sense of permanent loss, permanent sense of loss that permeated my writing. Wow. So um, 
So you've been partying a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I just imagine. Did you go to Paris to write this book? Did you get the? Did you go there and write it in Paris? I wish. No, no. I did not. I I visited Paris just before the first book was released, but I had that was in 2018. But I haven't been back since. It's yeah. to be honest, Australia has had its borders closed. You couldn't, you can't leave, and it's very difficult to get in. So. Yeah. I haven't even been able to go on holiday because borders keep closing between states. It's been a very strange time. It's been a very yeah, strange yeah. time. Well, you, you know, yeah. it is. You, you go into any anti-mask rallies or anything lately? Or? <laughs> I, no, no, I'm not. In fact, Sydney's in lockdown at the moment, so uh, I'm not leaving my house without a mask as mandated by the government. So. Yeah, yeah, we just went in lockdown yesterday at midnight, so. Again. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, add it to the fires and things can only get better, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you know, I'll sit down and read your book and that'll make me feel better. Right? Well, I hope so. I hope so. That is my dearest wish. <laughs> see? That's, see? I knew it. I knew it. So, so what's <laughs> next for Tessa? What's next? Well, I have an idea for... Kiki Button in 1923. I um, am writing short fiction. My husband is Russian and they fled the Soviet Union in 1991. And I'm really interested, as I said, with the fanatical ideology, I'm really interested in, in Soviet Russia and how that worked and what it was like to live there, especially at the, at the beginning. So my grandparents-in-law time through the 20s and 30s and World War II. And of course, I have, and I have another idea. Um, I'm writing another novel set in the Sydney bushfires. Mm. Um, I really had to, I really have to write that out. I don't know if it'll be any good, but it's uh, something that I just need to write for myself at least. And mm. then, then I have more ideas and more ideas, and I just need more time. Yeah, and, you know, and that's fascinating. Do you ever? Um, so when you when you talk about getting into Russia and you talk about mm. the uh, this this ideology, um, do, do you ever think of writing kind of just a, a non-fiction book in that area? <laughs> you know what I mean? Just a fact thing to, to let people know what's going on? There are, s <clears throat> there are so many people who have done such a much, such, such a good job, a much better job than I think than I could do. I would do it if I felt that I could add something to the – historiographical conversation. Um, so I read, I read some fabulous books as research for Autumn Leaves, 1922, and one was called The Crucible by Charles Emerson. Right. So he's a trained historian, but he wrote the a set, it's called The Crucible, how sort of, uh, the, modern, the beginning of the modern world, 1917 to 1924, but it's written like a, like a diary of this thing happened on this day and it's all written in the present tense so as you read it it's like it's happening right now and that's very that's really interesting a uh, way of writing history and making it really present so it has this as i said it, it reads like a diary so it's almost like a novelistic conceit but it's all beautifully researched and footnoted and, and everything like that um so if i could if i could find a way to to add to the story perhaps using my husband and his family's story and ideas to explore what was happening in Russia at the time, then yeah, then yeah, I would consider it. But I tend to think through uh, fiction. That's what I'm trained to do and it's what I, I read a lot of. And I, when I have these ideas, I don't tend to think of it in terms of its history, but then to turn the history into fiction and have the characters, I say my family, I make one person into two or two or three and I add people who weren't there in order to explore the ideas in a way, in a different way. I like the way that uh, fiction can become so intimate, although, to be honest, a lot of the history that I've read recently is becoming more and more like that, the line between history and non-fiction and fiction can become very thin, very porous, shall we say. Yeah, yeah. And I find that really interesting, the, the books that are written right on that porous line, either as the, the non-fiction or the fiction and the, the movement between the two. Mm. Yeah. 
conspiratorial. <laughs> Suspicious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we know the type. We, we run across them all the time. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I so, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule, I wouldn't rule it out. But um, that's not where my ideas are going at the moment. Yeah. Oh, I think there are some words that that definitely should be used more, like bumptious. I think bumptious should definitely get more of a more of an outing. Bumptious and scrumptious. There we go. <laughs> They're going to be my words of twenty twenty one. Bumptious. Well, there you go. What does bumptious mm-hmm. mean? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll read it. A bumptious means sort of pushy, but <laughs> uh, bumptious. <laughs> Irritatingly self-assertive, according to Google. An impossibly bumptious and opinionated bore. There you go. Oh, is that what you're calling me? <laughs> wow. I've been calling Isn't it a great sorts. word, though? Bumptious. Yeah. It's so opposite to scrumptious, and they sound so similar. I'm like, hey, they could be used together some way. They've got you to be probably used together. could. And scrumptious. And the, and the person being told wouldn't know it. I mean, I didn't know I was being told that. Jeez. Yeah. Scrumptiously <laughs> bumptious. There you go. Yeah. Maybe that's oh, how there's... you can. That's your yeah. new handle. Now I'm ready. I'm ready. Mm. Well, now I'm set. <laughs> We've learned a lot, and my God. <laughs> You know, and you've done it all. My, you've done it all. Look at you. Look at you. Um, anyway, uh, this has uh, been a great show, and uh, we've been talking about Autumn Leaves, 1922, and it's a Kiki Button mystery. And, of course, our guest is the one and only Tessa Looney. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.